All right. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the SGGA for giving me this opportunity to um, give this uh, talk about my in-progress game, uh, Photo Carnage. Um, so who am I? I hi, I'm Brendan. Uh, I'm also known as Chocolates on the internet. Um, I recently graduated from DigiPen Singapore with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Game Design. Uh, my skill set includes being a game designer, uh, being a programmer, and being an artist. So this is me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the general idea of what I do, I'm just going to show my portfolio reel. Um, oh, I just realized you wouldn't be able to hear the audio if I stream it from my screen. Sorry, can I, uh, let me, give me just one second to stream Firefox instead of. Okay, Sorry no about problem. This. Uh, here we go. So you should be able to hear it now. Did I kill anybody's ears? Okay, the last the last part is horrible. Let's just try to skip past that real fast. Oh no! Okay, okay, there we go. Okay, so um, I, I made a bunch of stuff while I, while I was at Digipen. Uh, some were more notable than others. These are some of the things that I've achieved during my time there. Uh, so that was all well and good. And then I graduated, and I was like, man, uh, what do I do? I knew that I wanted to go into uh, indie development, uh, preferably solo. So I was like, you know, I'll just make a video game. Like I've made a lot of video games in my time at Digipen. How could this possibly go wrong? It, it went wrong. So, uh, I'll just like to go through some of the failed prototypes that I've made. Um, so this is the first one. It was basically a game where uh, monsters can try to hunt you down, and they have a specific pathfinding algorithm that makes it so that they will actually um, try to group up and find you and try to like trap you in a corner and stuff like that. But it was a lot of like effort for not very little output because I think nobody really knew about advanced AI. So uh, then the next uh, prototype was more similar to Apocalypse, the first game we saw. But I wanted to make more of a advanced weapon system, right? So I was like, okay, I'll just uh, make it more RPG-like. So a lot more about like uh, small amounts of damage and trying to balance out the best weapon. And that wasn't very satisfying to me either, so I dropped that as well. Eventually, I was like, okay, I'll just make a game about frogs beating up other frogs with suplexing. So, so this game was about suplexing things through bullets and having them explode on the ground. And uh, that was a cool concept. The only problem was that I didn't know how to expand on it. I didn't feel that it was something that I could expand on very easily. 
So this was also a no go. Um, then I was like, I'll just take that and make it top down. I wasn't really thinking that hard about it at this point, and this was, had the same problem, and that um, it was uh, something that I couldn't really expand on very easily. Um, so after all of that, I was like, ah, screw it, I'll just make a dungeon crawler. So I, uh, I was like, I went completely out of my comfort zone, and that's something that I learned uh, later on was uh, somewhat bad to do. I feel that like as a game developer, you should be teetering on the edge of your comfort zone. Because there's a lot of stuff that you can learn by going outside your comfort zone. But um, there's also a lot of stuff that you can make very easily if you stay within it. So, uh, yes. Spongebob meme, very good. So, a little while later, I ended up making a Total Carnage. Uh, and what it is, is a tongue and up hostage rescuing game featuring terrain destruction and environmental abuse. So that's just me reading off the slide doesn't really tell you that much about it other than being intriguing. Um, but I think this is the one prototype that actually worked out for me. Um, so I'm actually going to show some uh, trailer that I made specifically for this presentation. Uh, let me just... Okay, so uh, that's that. That should oh, <laughs> whoops. That should give you an idea of like um, the features behind the game. But I'll just go through it. Uh, you can basically shoot your tongue at everything, and it basically allows you to interact with the game world. So uh, you can't directly kill enemies with it, but you can use it to destroy terrain, and you can also use it to abuse the environment to your advantage. What this means should be clearer now. It means that you can basically shove subblades into enemies. You can basically set off traps. You can do a lot of chain of reaction stuff for it. And it allows you to approach levels in multiple ways. And uh, the way you'd beat a level is to rescue all the hostages, but the hostages can also be destroyed by uh, the enemies or by yourself. So uh, it can backfire on you very easily. So uh, narrative, and yes, that is a frog giving the middle finger. Um, so the idea is there's a nuclear tsunami and everyone's turned into sea creatures. Uh, you're a toad cop gone rogue. The reason you have your tongue only is because they took your gun and your badge. So you only have your tongue. And you have to fight and take down gangs run by villains such as uh, Big Daddy, Angler Fish, and Croco Loco. I'm not the best at coming up with with uh, villain names. Uh, and also maybe uncover a deep sea conspiracy. This stuff is still a work in progress. I really felt the game should be a mechanics focused game firstly. And uh, I felt that the uh, story should play into the mechanics. So why did I choose this prototype over the other prototypes? Firstly, it's simple, but it's not straightforward. So what I mean by that is that while it is something that you can understand immediately by actually looking at it, um, it's not something that uh, is very straightforward in this execution, right? You can't directly kill enemies like you can in a lot of my other games, and that makes it so that it's easy to expand on it and stuff. So uh, it also means that you have to actually think outside of the box in order to achieve a lot of the solutions that you get. Um, it's also easy and rewarding to expand upon, and what I mean by breadth inspires depth is that... So in this kind of game, a lot of the items that you add directly interact with a lot of the other items. So for example, you add a saw blade, right? It will interact with the pressure plates, it will interact with the explosive barrels, it will interact with the player, it will interact with the enemies. Adding new items will not only increase the breadth, but will exponentially increase the depth of the game as well, mechanically speaking. Um, it is also just at the edge of my comfort zone. I was talking a bit earlier about how when I stretched too far out of my comfort zone, I feel like I wasn't making as much progress, right? So being at the edge of my comfort zone means that I'm still learning stuff. I'm still approaching it in interesting manners. I'm not falling to all the habits, but at the same time, I'm making stuff fast as well. Uh, I also find it very fun to make because it keeps surprising me with new interactions. I'll give an example. 
um, the tongue that uh, we have there. When I first implemented it, I made it so it can move any uh, movable object. So uh, when I ended up using it to deflect the bullet, I didn't expect that it could deflect bullets, but it made sense given the stuff that I coded in. So it actually surprises me with uh, emergent mechanics. So I would like to bring up Ikigai as well. Ikigai is this Japanese concept of actually having an intersection between passion, mission, profession, and vocation. And uh, if you have an intersection, you actually basically have a good job or a good idea or whatever it is. So um, let's go through it. What, what you love. I love making this game. I find it very rewarding to work on and I find it uh, as fun to make as it is to play for me. What you're good at, like I said, is teeters at the edge of my comfort zone, but it's still, uh, it's still there. I can still make stuff relatively fast and I'm used to making a lot of like fast-paced action games. What it can be paid for? I believe that this game uh, has a bu uh, some potential market value because it has a low barrier of entry but a high skill ceiling. Um, and what the world needs, the world needs more frog games. I think that's self-explanatory. So I'm going to go through some concept art. So this, uh, this uh, what I call him just now, a uh, big daddy angler fish or, or DJ angler apparently. So um, yeah, so he has RGB lights on top of his head like a true gamer. And also there's like this fiddler crap thing that like screams at you. And I was thinking like in terms of mechanics, right? Like I was thinking stuff like how can I take uh, marine creatures and basically put them in a context where they can serve uh, mechanically in my game. So for this one, I was thinking more physics based, like it's based around his arm, he's very large and he carries his whole weight. For the lighting, I was thinking it could be used in the dark and stuff. Um, and then we have stuff like this, uh, puffer fish, uh, octopus with like knives and one Uzi, a transport vehicle and a swordfish holding an actual knife because I thought that's really stupid. So I ended up actually porting a lot of these over to pixel art. As you can see, um, a lot of the charm I feel is kept, but a lot of the colors have to be uh, changed. Well, there's no colors in the concept art, but what I mean is that like a lot of stuff has to be changed, but the mood of it, I try to keep it the same. So how do I actually go about designing my game? So I use Master Plan, which is um, kind of a mind mapping kind of software. Um, so I actually uh, think about my game in terms of systemic gameplay. And it might be wrong to call it systemic gameplay in this context because it's usually applied to games like Breath of the Wild or Deus Ex, immersive sims with a lot of mechanics. But I feel that it applies in this, in terms of this as a philosophy. So it's based around rule-based systems, and what that means is that they are predictable. If I step into a fire, I'm going to be set on fire. Everything that goes into that fire is set on fire unless it has an opposite element like water or something, right? It means that you can make plans around those things. In terms of my game, um, knowing all those rules allows you to make plans for what to do and to be able to find new solutions. Um, it's used a lot in roguelikes as well as immersive sims, and usually it can result in solutions that, um, that the developer didn't think of, which has already happened with my game a few times. Um, items are generalized and are treated as emitters and receivers, so everything interacts with everything else. This is a bit more technical, uh, but this is basically how they will work. Um, they wouldn't, I wouldn't say, okay, uh, if you touch this torch, this is what happens. Instead, the torch emits a fire signal and you receive the fire signal. And that way, there's kind of a proxy and everything can interact with everything else as a result. So I would like to talk a bit about task priority and how I figure out whether to add something into the game. So let's give the example of like, say, a uh, saw blade, right? The saw blade, I first think about it in terms of systemic connections. How many systemic connections does it have with the rest of the game? Can it interact with the player? Can it interact with the enemies? Can it interact with the explosive barrels? Can it interact with anything else? How does it interact with those things? So for example, uh, if the saw blade interacts with the, the other things in the same way as everything else, that makes it very much lower priority. But for example, a cannon, a cannon makes it so that you can shoot anything out of it that's mobile. And that makes it so that it's much higher priority because it stands out from the rest of the crowd. The next one is obviously implementation difficulty because uh, it decides how many resources or how much time I put into that particular task. And the last one is narrative relevance, which is not as important, I feel, because you can usually shoehorn it in or fix it in. For example, the saw blades, uh, for my particular game at least, for example, the saw blades can be made into sea urchins or something else. 
or it can be said in a mad scientist layer. Um, as you can tell, I'm a much more mechanics focused person, so I think about them first, and that's how I, that's why I rank the, my task priority like this. If you want further reading on like this kind of thing, I'll recommend a game design vocabulary by Anna Entropy and Naomi Clark. And the first half of the book goes through this way of thinking about games in terms of verbs, objects, contexts, and scenes. So this is how uh, I think about my game. So inspirations. I'm going to be a completely egoistical maniac and say that my first inspiration is a game that I've already made, Alpacalypse. The reason why is because it is a game that I wish Alpacalypse was. Uh, Alpacalypse was not a very systemic game. It was more of a shooty shooty bang bang explosion kind of game. Um, I feel that it, uh, at first I was teetering towards the systemic side, but as the game went on and I found a lot more direct solutions to the problems that I had, uh, it made it so that it was a lot harder to invent interesting solutions to what I had. Um, also there's Broforce, which inspired Apocalypse. Lots of shooty shooty bang bangs. Um, but also there's a lot of items that interact with each other, like rockets that when you step on, they fly off and stuff like that. Uh, a much better example of something that will inspire my game is something like Spelunky. Spelunky is like um, a roguelike, but it really hangs on the, uh, the one facet of roguelikes, which is that everything is generalized. So much like uh, immersive sims and systemic games, which I've previously talked about. So uh, moving on to the art process. So I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm also an artist. I do digital painting. Um, for this game, I'm using a sprite, which is for pixel art and Photoshop, which is for just general purpose stuff. So the first question is why pixel art? Um, firstly, it's easier to animate when you have frame by frame animation and you're doing subframe animation and stuff like that. Interpolating between the frames is much easier when you have a limited color palette and limited re resolution. Uh, having distinctive silhouettes is something that comes about as a result of having pixel art because Having a limited color palette and limited resolution automatically means that uh, you can actually you need to actually make distinctive silhouettes. Otherwise, people won't know what you're they're even looking at in the first place. So it kind of forces you to do that. It's very nostalgic, which is a plus for a lot of people. And we are seeing this new trend where it's nostalgic for newer gamers as well, because they were playing games that were inspired by the older games to give people nostalgia. But it's come full circle, so it's a pretty interesting phenomenon. And personal preference, I just like pixel art. I've never really made a game with pixel art or like featuring pixel art very heavily. Um, so this, uh, this is something that I wanted to do and I'm finding it like it's a good choice practically as well. So what I use for the backgrounds is something called HD index painting. Um, HD index painting is a method of converting black and white or grayscale images that are painted on into pixel art. Uh, and that basically maps, gradient maps it from a black and white image into like a blue to white image or something like that. And it allows you to actually make pixel art very, very quickly. I might give a demonstration of this uh, at the end if we don't run out of time because I'm giving another demonstration featuring like how to put in enemies into the game. But basically it's not destructive. It allows you to actually move the objects around and they will still be on the pixel grid. So it's extremely useful for making pixel art uh, very quickly. And very to the background because of the limited color palette. So one other thing I use a lot is procedural animation. And I wasn't sure whether I should include this in the programming section or the art section, but I included it here because it's very, very visual. So uh, this I use something called numeric springing, which a lot of you might be familiar with. Uh, it's basically, in technical terms, it's an interpolation from one point to another point based on a spring. In non-technical terms, you go from one point A to point B, but you're boing along, along it, yeah. So that can be used for rotations, it can be used for scaling, it can be used for positional stuff as well. And here you can see it used for rotation as well as for scale. So it makes it a lot dynamic because uh, having that feature allows you to have the animations based on what the player is doing at that time in a very... Uh, in a very precise way. So like if the player happens to be landing when he's like falling very fast, there'll be a different type of squish. Uh, it won't be a static animation like usual. It's also very easy to implement. Uh, lots of, of uh, it's very easy to implement into any framework, like under like 10 minutes. 
and to add to a character is also like under like five minutes you can probably have this kind of behavior going on i'll actually be showing that off later on during the demonstration it also can be combined with regular animations and that's something a bit trickier but uh, if you time it well you can basically use it to uh, fuel regular animations as well so the technical process i use unity and i use visual studio with vim the reason i point out vim is because i feel that it speeds up my process massively it's a keyboard focused text a model text editing system and i recommend to look into it if you have the time because it makes it so that you don't have to use the mouse as much and it makes it so it speeds up my process a lot more so I'll talk about my overall structure, and I just realized I didn't animate this slide, whoops. Um, but everything that can be interacted will inherit from the interactable object. Uh, interactable has a list of responses, and responses are custom classes that can be stacked. What this means is that, for example, if I want the spikes to damage things, I just add a damaging collision response. And if I want them to be indestructible, I just add an indestructible collision response. So uh, these will be called from the interactable's physics collisions and stuff. And at this point, you might be wondering, why not just use uh, components and then just assign them in an inspector? The reason I don't do this is because I prefer to have uh, to not have to create one file for every single component I have. And also because doing it this way, I get to actually decide, I actually get to decide like delegates and all that for these uh, particular components very easily. Um, so in addition to contact responses, we also have death responses and stuff like that. Like what happens when you die, right? Do you explode? Do you damage everything around you? I'll show this off later on as well. Um, so it works in this case as most of the interactions are done through physically interacting with the object. If you are making a game like this X, or you're making a game that's an immersive sim where you have a lot of interactions possible, I will not recommend this approach because this is um, specific to contacting, like physically contacting that object. But since that's the way that uh, a lot of items interact in my game, I find it fine. I also have a pixel perfect collision system. At this point, uh, for the technical process, I'll be speeding through it a little bit. Because, uh, but if you have any questions about it, you can ask me later. Um, this is primarily used for the, for the player. And the reason why is because it allows me to have a lot more uh, fine grained control over the controller. And I basically uh, yoinked it from uh, Matt Thorson's uh, article on Celeste and Powerful Physics. I also have a custom animation system because I do not like Unity's animation animator for 2D stuff. Um, it allows me to import stuff directly from a Sprite, which is the animation tool I'm using, uh, the animation pixel tool I'm using, and it allows me to import frame durations and also has texture, texture atlas optimization. It also allows me to preview the stuff in real time. So this is how it works. Firstly, I go into here, I save out a thing, I export a spreadsheet, uh, PNG and JSON, and then I process it in Unity, and that's it. That's all there is to it. Oh, if I want to, uh, I can just have a player, and I can just type in the name of it, and it will preview it in the scene. Uh, it you can also be uh, modified or uh, transitioned to dynamically within the code. So the last thing I have is not really anything like big brain. It's like a build system. So. I find this, the reason why I point this out is because, so this is the code for it. This is all the code that you need for this. You can just screenshot this if you want and just use it in your own game. But you'll need Butler. So the reason why I use this is because Itch has this app called Butler and it allows you to basically, um, it uploads the difference in your, in your files. So um, bu building normally for me will be building, then zipping, then uploading through the web interface. And all that will normally take around five to 10 minutes. This takes about 15 seconds to build and upload. So quite useful for me. And uh, when playtesters use the itch app, they automatically receive the update. And that means that I get very fast iteration time. So I'd like to talk a bit about Twitch streaming. Also, all of you on Twitch, uh, um, hope that's OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, I stream most of my development on Twitch. And uh, the benefits of this are that I find it helps me focus on my work a lot more. And you might think, oh, um, Twitch, you have to kind of look at your chat, you kind of interact with the community. How does it help you focus on your work? For me, it's kind of like having somebody kind of watching over my shoulder. So I find it gives me energy and it makes and allows me to easily show off my work and I get good energy vibes from that. Uh, you also get good ideas from chat. So a lot of the people who are in my chat are familiar with the game. They've either played it or they've seen a lot of gameplay of it. And they normally can give a lot of good suggestions as well. Of course, it's good for self-promotion and for building a community. 
Um, my community at this point is more about my Twitch channel, not really about my game in particular, but it helps quite a bit. Um, reminded that these are completely subjective advantages. Um, what I mean by that is not that it's subjective whether these advantages are good. What I mean by that is that depending on person to person, you may or may not receive these advantages. So for example, if you're a very anxious kind of person, which I actually ironically am, but like I've moved past that. But if you are that kind of person, it might not help you focus on your work. It might make it worse for you, in fact. So uh, keep that in mind when you're thinking of streaming. Also check me out on twitch.tv just chop lips. Okay, so future plans, um, more enemies, more interactables, more levels. And these are all very vague on purpose, but all that comes in about three to four hours of gameplay. And I plan to finish it by the end of this year. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, I actually, I put questions here, but I actually have a demonstration to do right now. I decided to take on the very stupid task of like, um, deciding to show you guys how I concept art and code an enemy into my game in real time. So I'm going to be doing that. Can I, can I do that like now or should we like, I don't know. Okay. I will do that. Okay. So, uh, let me just show you guys my, like my planner. So this is like some planner that I got from Ish.io. Uh, let's do this. Right, this is probably going to be a disaster. Let's see how it goes. Okay. So I was like, man, law hands look pretty screwed up. I was like, man, I should make an enemy out of that. So I was thinking an explosive law hand with like the head as a pompadour. So what I do first is normally I go into like uh, a sprite and I'll like draw out the character. So like, let's just draw it out. So like something like that, like, it is going to be very scuffed up because um, I think we aren't able to see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's because I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. Give me a second. <laughs> yeah, I know. Whoops. Okay. Let me thing. show you guys again. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing. Okay. So I'm making. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm making this like Lohan enemy. Uh, like basically I, I thought like they look pretty screwed up. Uh, so I was like, man, what if like that thing was a pompadour and it could like, explode, they could explode in your face. So I was like, okay, I, I think that's easy enough to make. So I let me just retraw this. So um so basically I, I this how this A sprite this how I work in this and then like uh, around I'm using the symmetry tools right now. So I'm just gonna give it a big like bulb on this head. And I'm gonna like uh Yeah, good enough. Okay, fantastic. So I'm also gonna give it like some kind of Okay, yeah. Perfect, beautiful. So uh, let's uh, save that as uh, Lohan and let's export this. Actually, let's give it a bit of shadow. So something like uh, like that. And like, like, like that. Yeah, that looks fine. Um, so I'm going to go with this and I'm going to go with something like that. Okay, uh, save this and I'm going to export it as, oh no, sorry, not export. I'm going to export a spreadsheet, uh, PNG and JSON data. I'm going to export it. So I'm going to go into oh. Unity, which, why is Unity not opening? Unity, please. Okay, there you go. Let me close this down first. Okay, here we go. So this Unity, I am going to go to my animation manager and I'm going to process it. As you can see, the law hand is over here. So if I take my prefabs and take my enemy template and I type Lohan into here, you can see it appears and I can uh, animate it as well. We can do that later on actually. Actually, let's just do it now, get it out of the way. So I'm going to create another frame and then I'm going to grab the, the this thing. And I'm going to like make it larger. This is not how you should be doing pixel art. Do not scale your pixel art like this. I think it will give like people who actually do pixel art an aneurysm. So, okay. Apologies to any pixel art masters in chat. Okay, so um, let's see. Fantastic. So I'm just going to make that like a bit longer, 200 and 200. Like I said, I made the um, tool so that it can actually import the frame data as well. Uh, so I'm going to export the spreadsheet again, and then I'm going to process it. Okay. So if I go onto here, you can see it bulging out. And uh, so the, the outline is very large right now, but like, don't worry, it won't look like that in the game. Actually, let me show you what it looks like. It looks like this, right? So actually let's code out like uh, the enemy real quick. So let's go into like my enemies. 
And I have a Lohan enemy like right here. Uh, I think it's empty. Yeah, it's empty. Okay. So I actually have like a, a base template in like another wind monitor in case I screw up. So I'm, uh, but I think I, 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 I can probably do most of this on the, you know, on, on the flyer. So, uh, what uh, I would first like to mention that the code is probably going to be quite terrible because I'm just doing this live and showing you a general idea of how I implement enemies into my game. So firstly, I would like to take, take in all of the required stuff, um, that I need for the, for the, for the script, like the animation and uh sprite renderer and also a let's say a rigid body 2d as well so and then we need to do some generate some overrides so let's go with uh i don't actually remember i think it's like start and then die and then load responses and then update yeah okay i think that should be good enough so i'm gonna move start and update up uh, i'm gonna move this all the way up here okay so let me just make it larger so that you guys can see. So, uh, what, what, what are we going to do first? We're going to say RB is equal to the rich body, so, so that everything is assigned. So, R is equals to NM, like the component sprite renderer, right? And the uh, key thing now is that we can immediately say load responses, right? We can say uh, contact responses, which is what I showed just now. Uh, can you can add a new damageable contact which is collision response? And if you look at the parameters, it also has um, affected by wall, yes or no, right? And um, and the minimum wall impulse required to actually activate it. So we have something like this, and then you also have a dev responses. And you can basically use this to create something that will just die when it hits anything that's... So that's a good start, I think. So let's say uh, when it dies, it will destroy everything in its vicinity in 64 pixels of radius. Let's say something like that. Uh, is this good enough? Probably. Then we can just try it out, see whether it works. Uh, okay. Let's try it out. Oh no. Wait, what? Oh no. The responses, that responses. Oh wait. You know why? God, I didn't, I didn't apply this. <laughs> the thing on Twitter. I didn't apply the script. <laughs> Sorry, my brain is farting a bit. Never done live coding before. I'm gonna unpack completely and oh yeah, I didn't assign the an in player. So uh this should make it so that when I hit this, it will just explode like that. So it's quite it's quite easy to do get something working immediately. So uh what I also want to do is I want to make it so that it will delay the explosion a bit, right? Uh so we can do something like death delay time, which is something that I haven't built. It's like 0 0.5, and then we can also make it so that uh yeah, let's say that delay time is that, and let's make it so that sr dot uh, color, color color dot look, sr dot color color dot red. So basically, what this does is that if death is triggered, then after that, uh, turn it red. I think that should work. Uh, let's see. Hey, look at that! Wow. Okay, so uh, it kind of doesn't have any like juice or like any feedback or any like chasing you or anything so let's actually do that next so uh i think what i need to do next is uh probably have it chase after me so let's actually have it so that it looks at me so uh this is kind of this is kind of like just regular code so i think something like this where it's like game manager player object transform the position so we're just going to grab the difference between the two transforms and then we're going to do an X and say it's zero. Uh, one? One. So, so this will basically make it so that it will look at the player. Um, it will basically look at the player depending on which side the player is on. I hope I didn't mess it up. Like It might be the other way around. It was the other way around. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, so something like this. And then uh, we can also make it so that like it starts chasing after the player. So let's just do an add for us. Um, actually, this should go and fix up it. Nah, it's fine for now. This is just an example. So, um, oops. Oh my god. Okay. Then we normalize that. Then we'll see around like something like this. So we'll just have it like chase after the player. 
and this is where I want to talk about the art side of it, right? The numeric springing stuff. So it's going to change out the player. The thing about this, right, is that since it's suited to like um, the enemies and stuff, right? If the enemies hit it, it will get triggered. So anything that's not, um, you know, anything that's uh, not um, the wall will basically trigger it. So now that we have this, let's actually show how to how I do my uh, feedback and juice. So I have a vector tree uh, original sprites. Yeah. And we'll have like sprite scale. So these are the two things you require for numerical springing. So uh, on update, on every update, I'm gonna do something like this. So uh, SR the transform the vertical scale scale helpers vector spring vertical scale. We're gonna say uh, we're we're gonna say use this uh, velocity and move towards your original scale. If that makes sense, and have a dampening of 0 0.1 with a speed of 20. So this way, it will basically try to interpolate to that position. So then we can go when you die, or when you get triggered to die, um, you take uh, your local scale and then you squash it. So that will be original sprite scale, and we'll do something like this, uh, like that. So whenever it gets triggered, it's gonna like bounce a bit. So that's why I just did. When it gets triggered, it will squash, and then the squashing in the update, it will try to return to its or original scale, if that makes sense. Oh, that was, that was not intended. The reason why that happened is because I didn't set original scale. So, okay, there you go. Sorry about that. So this should work now. So, point, there you go. So now if you, uh, if you look at it, we have something that's pretty juicy and uh, can explode and can react with everything else. And you can also, of course, like uh, use this along with any other things. Actually, how am I doing on time? How long have I been demonstrating for? Um, uh, uh, Yukiko, do you know how, how long I've been demonstrating for? Or? Wait, am I still in the Discord? Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah, oh, sorry. Shit. I just had to unmute. Uh, yeah, don't oh, worry okay, about sorry. it. Don't worry about it. Just go. Okay, on. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just keep going a bit. No. Sorry about that. I thought I thought something went wrong on my side. Um, so I'll, I'll just make it so that it, uh, like alerts the alerts the thing, and then we'll just make it like more bulb brewers, I guess. Like, I don't know, something like this. Uh, boom. Just like do something like that. I mean, this looks pretty screwed up. So this is for when, like the when uh, it's basically been uh, triggered, right? Something like this. Yeah. Okay. So we you can we can have like in between or something, but we don't have time for that. So we're just going to I'll save as Lohan explode, and then we're gonna export that sprite sheet, and then we're going to process it. Then what you can do now is that once you die, or once you trigger the death, you can just go um, anim dot instant play anim um, lohan explode like that. And actually, well, I actually haven't tested that one out yet. I did a bunch of testing before the stream, but ooh, it, yeah, it worked. It worked. You can see that the. Uh, the bouncing is a lot more violent now. And you can also like make it like have less um uh sh uh short shorter time spent. So you can say 50 and 50. It'll be like that. If you want that kind of effect. So I'm gonna export it again and then uh process it. Yeah, there you go. Uh so yeah, that's how you basically make a simple enemy within the, the context of uh of this game. Uh, hopefully that gives a, in, some insight into how I basically made the enemies and interactables. Um, I think that like uh, the main thing to take away from this is to have some kind of system where you can dynamically put like uh, very uh, like Lego blocks kind of and kind of like build them up that way. Um, in addition, you should also have a framework for like doing this kind of springing stuff very easily. Uh, the springing, I'll just show the code for it real quick. It's just this, and the spring code is this. All of this is in the slides. Uh, if you go to the, the numerical spring, 
section, there is a link to an article where you can just uh, find find the algorithm for this and put it in your game in like five or ten minutes. And it's very easy to uh, get working. And yeah, that's about it. I think. Yeah. All right. Does anybody All right. does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute or um write it in the text channel so that I can I can ask your questions for you. Everybody is talking about a Lohan. Oh dang. Um, I I have a question. Yeah yeah yeah. Um, hey Brandon, uh, thanks oh, so much for sharing and your presentation. That was awesome, awesome. and hey. the demo was really cool. Um, so uh, the question is around uh, the prototypes that you made. So I'm very yeah. impressed by how many prototypes you got through in what I assume is like two to three months, relatively short amount of time. Yeah, about that. Um, but what I'm wondering is um, the way you described the prototypes were quite were quite critical, um, and I think. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of good sides to that, right? Like it made you kind of find this game that you really love working on now. Um, yeah. but I'm wondering, did you did you ever struggle with like that the critis critical side of yourself affecting your motivation and yeah, like yeah, your day to day, okay. like like overthinking a bit too much and um, oh, yeah, and affecting definitely. your workflow? How yeah, how would you how do you manage that? So. Uh... Might not be the best person to ask about this because I'm very self-critical in my own work. Like, um, I I remember like one of the streams uh, when I was doing the dungeon crawler, right? Uh, I basically like there was this sudden realization that this wasn't gonna work out the way that I wanted to, right? So I was like really sad at the time, and I remember like a bunch of like uh, people from my chat like uh, kind of like helping me through it. I feel that uh, the way that you can kind of snap yourself out of this, or at least how I did it, was that I had a support network where that snapped me back to reality. They were able to give me some, um, they were able to clue me in on like what was a bit more objective about what I was doing. Like for example, you said that there were good points to what I was making, and that's true. It helped me like figure out a lot of stuff, and it was a learning journey. That's something that was I was blind to when I was actually like developing these things. Because I was always like, oh, this has to be the next one. This has to be it. This has to be it. This has to be it. Having like people you can talk to who are outside, maybe like even outside of the development community, but like people who can look at what you're doing and tell, give you advice. That's probably the most valuable thing you can have going for you in terms of motivation. See, okay, really cool. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so someone asked, what well, what's your?" Mo <laughs> Ask for motivation to make games. How to get motivation? I don't know how you're gonna oh. answer that. How to get motivation to make games? Uh? Yeah. Uh, so I find that like uh, for games, right? I think that for me the motivation comes quite naturally, but in some cases I always feel like I'm kind of sl slogging through it a little bit. Uh, but in terms of finding motivation for games. I guess it's like you have to treat it as kind of like there's motivation and there's there's passion, right? But there's also discipline. So I find that what I tend to do is I tend to try to make myself make it a habit. So I watched this talk recently um, by I think Lex Friedman. He well, he's working on self driving class, but he basically talked about how to make stuff a habit. So you just do it every day for like ten to twenty minutes. You don't have to even have to do it for a long time. Like 10 minutes is enough, um, but if you do it every single day, eventually you won't turn into 10 minutes, it will just be longer. And uh, eventually you, you'll be able to kind of make it a habit and it will just be a part of you. At this point, I, I force myself to take breaks on the weekends, but otherwise I'll still be working on the weekends. My natural mode is just working. Okay. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention that. Do, take, do remember to take at least like a weekly break at least. Otherwise, you'll burn out, and then burning out is bad. Yes, breaks are very important, and I think I think that's very interesting. The uh, info you just shared. Uh, okay. So, Ivan is asking which version of Unity is this? Uh, this twenty twenty. Um, but I don't think the version matters. So twenty twenty point two point two F one, but a lot of the developers I know stick with um the older versions. 
because they find them a lot more stable, like 2018 and stuff like that. Mm. So I don't think the version matters that much. Unless, so the reason why I will use 2020 is for the URP, like Universal Render Pipeline. The reason why I'm using 2020 right now is because I found that it fixed a certain specific bugs that I needed to get fixed. Um, mm. And that's pretty much the only reason. Okay, so... Um, I- uh, oh, sorry, there's not that question. Okay, Ivan. He also asked, like, he needs to know what you are using to process the sprites. Oh, why am I using to process the sprites? I wrote it myself. Uh, so I use a, I made a sprite post processor that basically goes through a sprite's JSON data and uh, takes out the data and then structures it and then uh, puts it into a list uh, that I retrieve from using a dictionary. So I made the tool myself. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Wei Qiang asks, how much time was spent in building the entire framework, the tools and pipelines, etc.? So, like your entire structure that you have? Five years. And that's not like a joke answer. The reason why is because I have been building up my framework since I was in DigiPen. So, I've actually, whenever I have something new that like mm-hmm. I find that I use a lot, I just put it, I just put it in my framework. So, I actually just like yoink it there and then after that, I don't need to think about it anymore. I hate thinking. I think I try to think as little as possible. I'm done. But I, <laughs> I just basically yank everything into a framework. And then like next time when I need something and it's just there. Mm-hmm. For example, my numerical springing has been there since I don't know, like 2017. The, the thing, okay, I would like to share something about that. The problem with that is that like, uh, like upgrading, uh, I had an animation uh, post-processor in Unity and Unity is updated, broke it. So mm-hmm. going back to the previous question, you might want to not update so much if you're going to be doing that stuff. Okay. Hold on. Uh, okay. It looks well worth first speed in prototyping. Okay, does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, I think yeah. Andrew said yes. Where's Andrew? Which Andrew? We have two Andrews here. Uh, sorry, sorry, what you say? The URP? I'm not. That's the thing. I, I, I'm not using it for URP. I'm using it to probably fix a certain bug. Uh, but if I were to use URP, right, the main, the main uh, advantage to using URP for Unity right now is to get direct, like 2D lighting and 2D shadows. But, but and here's a big problem. Uh, like the normal mapping and the uh, Shadows might not work for all instances. There's some bugs they haven't quite fixed. So I wouldn't go into it right now. Yeah. Okay. That was a question no that was a question on Twitch, is it? Oh no, that was uh, from this voice chat. He's talking. He's talking? Yeah, Cheryl, you cannot hear him, is it Andrew? Yeah, I cannot hear him at all. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Mm. Yeah, because we can. Alright. Uh yeah, that's weird, but it's okay. Uh, anybody else have any question? I'm an open book. Yeah, Andrew, you mute me, is it? That's why I cannot hear you. <laughs> Hello. Oh, oh, yeah, if anybody on Twitch has any questions, I'm also open to that. Like... Uh, Amanda was mentioning that people uh, on Twitch are talking about how the Lohan is pimple or cancer tumor enemy. Uh... Holy shit, you're right. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I need to fix that. Or like, honestly, I'm probably not gonna use like. Uh, let me show you guys originally like what I was gonna show for this presentation in terms of the. Is it this one? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was gonna show this enemy if you can see it now. Pufferfish. But I was like, that's a. It got a bit too complex, so I didn't end up doing it. Uh, okay, cheeky question, but any advice for your DigiPen Kohai? Uh, like, firstly, what what uh, what uh, degree are you doing? BSGD. Oh, yeah, that's the one that I was from as well. Uh, yeah. I, I well, I I have some notes on my website. You can go look at those, I guess. Um. But also, I, I think the main advice that I have is to not stress yourself out so much. Because, uh, but it's like very localized advice because like, for me, I used to like, 
be very very focused on like my digital stuff and all my game and all that and i think it kind of like wore me down after a while i would honestly suggest like um trying to learn i don't know if you i don't know you personally obviously or whether or i might i don't know me <laughs> do i but anyway um for for me for me i found that like it wore me out quite a bit um and i think some of you might know that i got hospitalized for overworking uh so that ex- extended my stay at digpen <laughs> So I would I would say that burnout is a very big enemy, and it's not something that like is normally talked about. I guess there's some glorification of of, of burnout that I don't think should be there. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's the answer. Does that answer? Oh yeah, yeah he answer. said he said I see tanks. Okay. Okay, are there any more Kohai or Senpai who wants any, want to ask any questions here? Open book, open book. Yeah. Minoru, uh, any questions? I, I, have, I have a question. So, um, all your tools and frameworks that you've been building for the five past years, right? Do you do a uh, documentation on it, on Google Sheets or something? Oh, well, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> so, you just do it as you feel that you need. La. No, the reason why, right? The reason why is because most of my projects that I do for, for myself are like just primarily for fun and I didn't think I was going to uh, most of the time I do stuff I don't really think I was going to use it for anything else um, when I do end up using it for myself I make it clear enough what the functions are and what everything is to not really require the documentation the way I do it is um, if you ever read the book Clean Code or I think yeah Clean Code there's like this thing about like uh, compartmentalizing and modularizing your code, right? So I try to do that as much as possible so everything serves a specific function. So my code isn't the best, but um, usually I know what to do with it. Even if I haven't touched the code for like four or five years, I still know what it does. I still know like how to use it. Sometimes. Sometimes I just open it I'm like, who the hell wrote this? Oh, it's me. <laughs> I notice your code is like very modular, just like super efficient. I think it's just like you mentioned you were lazy. I think in this case it's great to be lazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hate thinking uh, so I Yeah, but I sometimes but well, sometimes lazy people come up with the best solutions so, to make their life easier. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? No? No? Uh, Dajun is asking, have you thought about selling the tools on Unity Store? Uh, no, because the reason why is that... Actually, I, no, I have thought about it, but I decided not to do it. The reason why is because making the tool for myself is one thing. Having everyone be using the tool is another thing. Like, I will have to write proper documentation. The code will have to be very nice and neat. All the will have to be commented. Like, I wouldn't be comfortable charging a price for something that is um that i don't do that at least that amount of work in okay minero asks what plans do you have for the next game any sneak oh this videos? is this is the next game he's <laughs> asking yeah he's, he, uh, he's asking about the next one already after this. oh the next no uh well i have no idea man i, I don't even know what i'm gonna have for lunch tomorrow i, I can't answer that question yeah minero <laughs> <laughs> like I, I think like um for me right like I uh, a lot of people some some people kind of ask me like what like my dream game is but I have zero clue I just like make for me I think I just like making games so I'll just like I just keep doing it because I actually just like doing it yeah mm, okay uh they are attacking Minoru in the chat now <laughs> <laughs> oh no uh okay Daniel asks me how interactable the things are in the game are you planning to tweak the stages whenever a player finds an exploit that totally breaks the level uh no so the the I will not be doing that instead I'll be tweaking out how the interactables work the interactables should be the things that uh so like for example if us okay I'll give you an example right the cannon right uh it will shoot out any object, correct? So I was like, oh man, I'll just like put it here and then the whole level disappeared. You know what happened? It, it, it ate up the whole level, I was shooting out the whole level. So uh, then I was like, oh shit. Hey, but if I don't, if I just place it outside the confines of, if I just make it so that it doesn't touch the level, then it won't eat the level. 
then I was like, wait, no, uh, bad child, you shouldn't do that. So I didn't do that. <laughs> so I actually just fixed the thing. So if, if I have a problem with it, I try not to like fix the level, I try to fix the actual, the actual uh, interactable. There's two positives to this. Firstly, it doesn't kill you later on when you're making levels. And secondly, it means that you can make a custom level editor when you're done with it and people can still use it to make stuff. Hmm. Because otherwise they'll just break it. Yep. Uh, Brandon, could you just scroll to the the slide that you have with all your info, the last one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if anybody wants to follow Brandon or you want to look on his Twitch, go ahead here. Uh, do, does anybody else have any other questions? My Twitch can be quite cursed. I'm just I'm just like putting that out there. <laughs> Not a problem. So Brandon, yeah. in, in the end, uh, you know, c comparing your, what was it, three or four years in DigiPen versus all the time you've invested on your own to like, you know, you know, making, making stuff on your own time and, 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 you know, sort of invest, uh, inadvertently investing in your frameworks. Do you think that you got more out of like your quote unquote fun play time versus your formal learning at DigiPen? Oh man, that's a tough question. Not because it's tough to answer, but like, let me see, see about how to phrase this. Um, uh, it is political, don't, you don't have to like... No, no, it's not political, it's just more like, um, I think the, you, like the, so the, the direct answer would be, yeah, a lot more. Like, I feel, and I think this is something that the teachers will also bring me up on. I feel that DigiPen is kind of like a base. Uh, <laughs> for, for me, right, like, I got a lot of my learning from studying stuff outside of DigiPen. So, for example, the numeric springing, that was not taught in DigiPen. Um, like a lot of the structure that I ended up using, it was from um, this book called Game Programming Patterns and like there was a talk about, it, like, about roguelike design patterns. All of that is not really taught in DigiPen. I think what DigiPen helps you is that like it makes it so that you know what you don't know. So as soon as, as long as you know what you don't know, right, you can chase after that. But if you go into it not knowing what you don't know, right, then you're kind of screwed up. Does that make sense? Mm, mm. Uh, unfortunately, I think that is a curse that uh, virtually everyone has, not knowing what they don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like at, least, like, at least knowing in general the basics of it, like, which is why I, at first when I went to DigiPen and they started with assembly and C, I was like, this seems a bit much. But like, over the years, I began to appreciate that because like, starting with the biz kind of helps a lot. I feel. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Does that answer your question, Ryan? I mean, it. Def I mean, it, I. I. I it, uh, would have. Uh, definitely, it's a subjective thing. At the end of the day, a lot. Some people will benefit yeah. from formal learning, and some, uh, you know, or especially people who don't have that drive to question themselves as to like w figuring out what they do or don't know lah. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean I think it's it's it, it's good to uh, there are, it, we don't often have uh, live examples of people who sort of strayed away from the from the uh, uh, you know the the well trodden path to try and find their own find the fun elsewhere lah, in a way a manner of speaking so it's good. It's yeah. good. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I will say that like um, uh, like for me it helped a lot but I was also actively seeking it out if you're not actively seeking it out it won't help also uh, Ivan um, the game programming patterns book is free online uh, if you just go to I think it's uh, gameprogrammingpatterns.com yeah gameprogrammingpatterns.com uh, it's free it's a good intro into like a lot of like the regular patterns that you find uh, like you know command pattern or like and stuff like that this is good. Would you recommend this uh, site for noobs? Uh, yeah. Wait, no, it depends on how noob is noob. Um, I, I, I feel like uh, after a primer of like... I, wait, sorry, sorry <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm blanking a bit. How, how noob are we talking? Uh, I mean, literally on the site it says, this is the book I wish I had when I started making games. So like, uh, maybe a better way to phrase this question is, at what level of uh, how how noob is too noob to prevent you from you from benefiting from from the learnings? Okay. Like, <laughs> uh, if you understand, for example, loops, conditionals, and stuff like 
uh, obviously all the basic stuff and you have to understand have a basic understanding of encapsulation and inheritance and stuff like that in order uh, to be able to read this book. Okay. It's not too bad. So if someone took like a crash, uh, you know, not having to spend like a whole foundational year at DigiPen or whatnot, like, if they took like a 10 week course on uh, say C++, they should be fine. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Should be fine. But also the book is like, it's, it's a really good primer, but like a lot of the stuff that I ended up learning, for example, uh, I ended up learning stuff like uh, valet integration and like, uh, and like inverse kinematics about how to implement those kind of things. When I learned those kind of things at school, right, like in my own spare time, I had to get it from a lot of disparate sources. So I wouldn't say like I learned that much from books in general. It's just that this book helped me quite a bit. Mm. Makes sense. Cool. That's, uh, that's all I got. Cool. All right, cool. So um, last call for any questions. Any questions? Very inspiring, Ivan said. Inspiring oh, with, the, with the UWU. The Dang. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, someone is typing. Give me a moment. Huh? Mm. What oh, are you guys professionally? <laughs> Oh man, I was hoping this one wouldn't come up. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, oh man, I, I don't. So, for, for like. <laughs> wait, give me a sec. Uh, so, I, I know that, like, uh, I. Like I was saying earlier about, like, having to know what you don't know, right? I don't know anything about commercialization and stuff. So, what I ended up doing is I ended up, like, you know, Elwin, who, like, is the. Um, uh, the Holy Potato series. I don't know if how many of you know him. He's uh in the I think his nickname here is um something potato. Um basically I tried what I did end up doing was I yeah 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 they like studios yeah, yeah correct. Um what I ended up doing was I ended up asking him for a lot of advice so I actually talked to him weekly and I'm trying to actually start, like try to understand the more commercial aspect of things a bit better. So I am I fully admit that like in terms of like outside of game development, the stuff that is not directly related to game development, I am kind of like a noob at it. But um but I'm trying I'm trying I'm trying try my best to learn basically. That doesn't answer your question. I know I know for sure that doesn't answer your question. What I'm trying to say is that right now it's still up in the uh, in the air. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out what's the best call of action and I'm just um, talking to him every week and like trying to play, play it like that. Okay, uh, Ivan just Ivan just wrote something in Japanese, I don't understand what's that. But he, I think it's Lohan Plashish. Plashish? Plashish? Yeah, and, and at the same time I'd like to like thank like all the people that I've talked to. So I've been talk to, talking to a lot of game developers uh, and a lot <laughs> like... Like Brian also helped me out with some stuff. Uh, thanks Brian. Um, as, as a very quick. No uh, problem. Yeah. So like, um, um, there are, there are a lot of times that I didn't know what to do, and I found that like just seeking people out and asking was the best way. Yep. Or you can also just look and you know, disturb anybody. Yeah. 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 So uh, okay. I think with that, uh, in all honesty, marketing, advertising was something that would be nice to learn when we're in DigiPen. We're too rely on the school doing it for us. Oh, okay. The, does it mean that when you guys make a game, uh, DigiPen will help with like marketing, advertising it? Like, how does that work? So, uh, what Kyochi, uh means, I think, is that um, the in DigiPen, when we made a game, sorry, we put it on Games Gallery, Usually we didn't need to do anything after that. We made a trailer and that's about it. Uh, we didn't really like do anything. We just made the game, right? Which yep. in certain like job prospects is perfectly fine. But I yeah, like it depends on what you want to do after school, I guess. I see. So basically I, I mean sorry, go ahead. sorry, sorry. So pretty much it's more of uh if if you guys want to take the game further, you guys don't really know the steps to it lah. Uh, beyond, beyond I feel that now, I feel that now they're making classes for that kind of stuff. Uh. Mm. 
but at the time I not so much. Mm. But also also having said that, right, not everybody who goes comes out from Japan is gonna do like indie solo dev. I think in my entire batch I'm the only one who's like go, going this route. So mm. I, I, I feel like they they really did what they could out. Like a lot of the teachers that that they are very caring and they do care for like what what's gonna happen to the students after graduation. It's just that you can't uh, account for all case scenarios, you know? Mm, I see. Okay. To be honest, that's the brutal fact of game diplomas and degrees. Oh, that's a whole other conversation. I think if we talk about <laughs> this, it will probably drag for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> Join us for our next round table! Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we can maybe do this for a round table next time. We do we do want to do a round table with um students from all the different causes actually to find out more about uh what do you feel about your causes. So yeah, um okay, I take it that we don't have any more questions. I uh last one for Brandon actually. Uh, do yeah. you uh, do you recommend like do you recommend students to follow your path? Uh, uh okay, so well, not that fun. Um I think that like for me, right, I I don't know if it's like good to say, but like I don't think most people. Firstly, I don't think most people uh have the skill set to do a like solo indie dev. Like it, like I, I don't I can't do music, but I can do the design. I can do the art. I can do the programming. Um, and I and the thing is is the reason why is because like even when I was in DigiPen like even when I was doing game and all that I was also taking like BFA classes and I was like doing art almost like uh, every week I was doing some art practice so I, I feel that like even throughout I was still practicing and I don't think most people are willing to do that so I wouldn't recommend it for most people but I feel that it's very rewarding if you can do it I would say for most people try to uh, try to you know work in um try to try to get a get job experience and then try to work with other people for me there's a some medical issues that i have that are preventing me from actually doing it mm. so if i didn't have those medical issues i will i will probably be at and like a like at a game studio or you know something like that okay. so i will say no i will say i wouldn't recommend just jumping into in the solo dev like right off of school yeah. Maybe, maybe as a follow up question to that, what do you think? Uh, would you like to see the? I, I, it could be the schools. It could be external, um, external organizations. What do you think? Uh, would be necessary to be made available to students who are in your position in order to encourage more to to you know take. Take a shot at, at, at indie life. I it's a really tough one, but I think the main thing is a lot of people from what I knew, they were worried about the job security. Um so I feel if that could somehow be uh fixed, then a lot more people would be willing to take the plunge. But even then, right, even then I actually when I when, before I graduated I did ask a lot of people like whether they were wanted to go like solo development or at least like team with one or two other people and do stuff for it. Most people are not willing to because uh so this is a bitter fact, but like I think most people who enter DigiPen by the end of it, they don't like making games for one reason or another, right? Um I think they, a lot of them went in uh thinking they would like it and it just turned out they like something else, which is fine, which is perfectly fine. Mm. It's, it's just that it's a very hard thing to solve because of that. Because like, you, you, like if like, you can't take what they say at face value, like they'll be like, oh, I like making games. You can't take that face value until after a few years in the school. Then it's kind of hard to like plan for this kind of stuff, I feel. So my, my answer to that is, I'm not sure, but I, I, I guess like trying to, if there's a way to actually figure out early whether they are invested in like games or like passionate about games and also whether and also if there's a way to remove most of the risk or not most of the risk like some of the risk at least uh that will probably be best but i think those are like probably obvious answers mm, i mean yeah anything to do with money is usually an obvious yeah. answer. 
But I think like uh, you know, it's more about looking, trying to observe the cultural factors, like that sort of. Uh, yeah, I tried to do. I try when while I was in Digipen, I tried to start a club where we actually do game gems, you know, or like we try to just trade information. We do talks, presentations, and trade information with other students. Mm. Um, no, so very few people wanted to join because of the workload already, and after I got hospitalized, less people wanted to join for obvious reasons. Um, yeah. But 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 yeah, I don't think I I hate to say it, but I don't think at the time that I was in Digipen. That many people are that passionate about games. I'm just I'm, uh, that's my honest opinion, uh, But yeah, yeah, that's not everybody yeah. obviously. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll do a last question and then we'll wrap up the session. So I do have a question from Poila. Uh, okay. how do you time manage if you were given a nine to seven job and you want to develop your passion project as fast as possible? Oh, okay. That's uh. Okay, so I, I cannot answer the question, but I can direct you to a talk that t- talks about this exact topic. So there's this uh, talk by Tom Francis on GDC uh, called, where is it? Let me, let me just find it. Uh. Um, sorry, sorry, just just give me a sec. Uh. Because that he, he deals with this topic very, very well. And I think he goes into, into it a lot more. Ah, here we go. Lessons learned making gunpoint quickly without going insane. Um, and he talks about uh, how to prioritize tasks, how to, w- because he was actually doing this in like during the weekend. And uh, I learned a lot from this task, the talk, from this talk, even though a lot of it didn't apply directly to me. And uh, yeah, I would highly recommend, actually I'll just paste it in the chat if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, paste it in the chat. Everybody's asking yeah. for the link. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, but yeah, this, this is an extremely good talk on that. And he's a very direct person. so. He explains uh, it very well. I, I think that's a too large a topic to cover in one question. So that's why I'm so sorry, but that's, that's why I'm like giving this link. Okay, no problem. All right, I think with that, um, we can end off the Indie Soap Boss questions. Um, after this, you guys are free to just mingle around in the chat room and talk, talk whatever you want. Okay. Thanks everyone. Yeah. So thank you everybody for attending. <laughs> Yes, thank you everybody for attending today's Indie Soapbox session.